Thank you. All right, it is good to be here with you this morning. Just a quick um, plug for the college age ministry. I oversee the college age ministry, so 18 to 23 year olds. Um, and that doesn't mean just by like spirit. So if you're 70 and you feel like a 20 year old, you can't come. I'm sorry. It just doesn't, doesn't quite work out that way. Um, but tonight at 730, our, our very own Levi Spangrud is going to be sharing. And I'm excited for the word that he's, God's placed on his heart. And then afterwards, we're going to go to a local favorite. I know there's a lot of college students that are back in town. We're going to go get some El Rodeo. Because how many know that the Lord loves chips and salsa? Amen. Can I get an amen? Some queso, some quesadillas. That's, that's some, uh, some good food. So tonight, 7.30 at the Student Campus Chapel. Um, I, I always try to take a moment when I'm, I'm speaking uh, to, to show off my family. So here's a picture of my, my family. Uh, this was just taken a, a handful of weeks ago, my, my beautiful wife, Elizabeth. And uh, she, we've been married for um, a little over five years. And our oldest son, Sam, who's going to be four next Sunday. And then Paisley is in the red. She just turned two in November. And Essie... Um, is a little over six months, and I just absolutely uh, love them to pieces. I love looking at this picture, and I'll tell just a, a quick little story. You know, as a parent, and I don't know if any other parents relate to this or not. It's probably just me, but sometimes, and most of the time, actually, I just kind of feel like things are out of control. Like, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, you just kind of do your best and, and hope for the best, right? Um, but the other uh, week at Thanksgiving, we're sitting around the, the dinner table, and Grandma Georgine's there, and my parents, and my sister, and her fiance are there, and we're going around saying, what are we thankful for? And so we get to um, Sam, and, and we say, Sam, what are you thankful for? And he goes, mm, the Bible. And I was like, oh, you're the best kid ever, like, so spiritual, four years old, you know, he's, this is great. And then a couple other people share, and and uh, we get to Paisley. So we say, Paisley, what, what are you thankful for? And she goes, this is the truth. She goes, mm, Jesus. And I was like, yes, I'm doing something right as a dad. And so I just hold on to that moment because there's often times I'm like, who are you? Where'd you come from? Uh, so I, I love them. And, and looking at this picture, I just, I just almost get uh, emotional just thinking of the love that I have for my family and how I would do anything. I would give anything. I would, I would sacrifice in so many ways for my family, and my love is just so intense and deep for them. And I would imagine that many of you, when you look at your family photos, that you would feel the same way, and you'd have the same sentiment. And, and I was looking at this picture this week, and, and, and I was just reminded of how much more intense God's love is for us as, as his children than my love is for my children. And, and, and I was reminded how much just stronger and greater and wider and deeper his love for us is and, and how he has done everything and he's given everything just so that he can be in a relationship with us. And, and that just floors me. That just moves me. Uh, the, the Bible says that we love God um, not so that he'll love us, but we love him out of response because of his love for us. And so we are responding to God's love. And, and I just want to encourage someone here this morning that you haven't done something that has disqualified you from God's love. There, there is nothing that you have done in the past, this past, last night, to this past year, you have not disqualified yourself from God's love. God loves you so much, and he wants to be in a relationship with you. He, he and I'm telling you, some people view a relationship as just being with God being like constraining and restricting. But I'm telling you, it's the most freeing and life-giving. It, it's like God's just breathing life and just like a, an empty coloring book, just taking colors and just starting to paint color into your life. And so I just want to remind someone here this morning, God loves you and he so desperately wants to be in a relationship with you. And, and I hope that at the end of this service that you'll enter into that relationship and, and, and um, you'll accept Jesus as your Lord. So just uh, as we start or continue this series on, on stories of hope, I just want to uh, see a, a show of hands. How many have ever had a prayer answered, no matter how big or how small, God has answered a prayer? Like, Lord, let me pass algebra two, right? Um, God, let me not choke my kids by nap time, you know? Like, just let it, let it be here. I, I would never do that, um, 
um, you know, I, I just by the show of hands, it just, it just reaffirms in my heart that God is a God who loves us and he's involved in our lives. And even when we can't see him working, he's working in the background and he's moving and, and working in ways that are unknown uh, to us. And so I just want that to allow your faith to grow this morning. So we're, we're continuing the series of hope and the title um, and the theme that we're talking about today is, is healing. Now for, for many people, when we talk about healing, there's a lot of mixed emotions that can kind of come up with this. And, and as a pastor, as an individual, I've, I've seen it all. I've, I've, I, I, I dare say I've seen it all. I've, I've seen so many different instances of, of healing. I've, I've seen where God has just divinely and just miraculously healed someone on the spot. About th- five years ago, four or five years ago, a man named Wayne Nichols walked right down here and is right at the break of where the, the slant and the floor, and, and my dad and I were able to pray for him, and he shared with us that he had this big tumor, stage four cancer, pretty much a death sentence, and uh, he, he didn't really know about God. He didn't really know God, but with receiving this news, he started searching, and, 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 and he started, you know, looking for answers, and so he said, well, I'm going to give church a, a try, so we said, can we pray for you, and, and I remember standing right there just kind of on that side of the aisle praying for this man, and he went to his next doctor's appointment, and that large tumor was completely gone, and God just completely healed him of that cancer. He's still alive five years later. Amen. And, and his, his daughter is an oncologist. His daughter's an oncologist, and she had seen the report. She had, she had seen the prognosis. I mean, and she's just completely amazed at what God did. I've seen God answer prayers, but I've also seen and, and had times in my life where I've prayed and believed for something that it didn't come to pass. And, and it didn't turn out the way that we were believing and asking God, like my grandfather who died of cancer at the age of 66. You know, I, I don't know why uh, he, he wasn't physically healed, but that's just was, was a, a part of it. And, and I've seen where God has used doctors and medicines and surgeries to bring about healing in people's lives. And I've also seen where a surgery that should be super simple and, and procedures and medically, I mean, this is a guaranteed, it's, 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 a, it's a gimme, where a, a, a surgery that works 99.9% of the t- time turns fatal or, or causes um, someone to become paralyzed or, or just it, it's a fail. I've, I've, I'm, I'm guessing that many of you are like me, and we've kind of seen a different array of healings. And some of you um, might have picked up some bad theology or have misunderstandings or just might be ignorant and not know kind of about uh, biblical healing. And so I want to address just for a, a brief moment um, about some of the myths of, of biblical healing. The first myth is this, if I'm a good enough person, I'll be healed. No, nowhere in scripture does it say that. Another myth is, if I don't get healed, God must not love me. Or if I don't get healed, there, there's got to be sin in my life. Can I, can I remind us all that we all have sin in our life? It, or, or another myth is, if, if God doesn't heal me, I didn't have enough faith. Or I didn't pray the right prayer. Or, or, or go down the list, or, or my sickness, or my ailment, or my, my disease, this is punishment from God. And, and there's so many people who walk around feeling like this has been caused. Those, those are not true. And today's sermon could easily go a different direction, and we could spend a lot of time talking about why some people are healed and why some people are not. But, but that's for a different day. But I will say this. In Hebrews 13.8 says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we as Christians believe in that fundamental truth that Jesus is the same, then we have to stand and believe that Jesus as a healer in the New Testament is Jesus' healer today. And I believe wholeheartedly, and I have so much faith and belief in God this morning that he's going to heal people, and he wants to heal people. Why? Because he's in the restorative business. He is restoring people physically. He's restoring people spiritually. He is restoring people emotionally and mentally and relationally. I believe that to the core because he loves us and he wants to bless us. And and at the end of of today, I'm going to invite anyone who wants to be prayed for, for whatever reason, to come forward. And we're going to believe in faith and expectation that God is going to move. In James chapter 5 verse 14, it says, if anyone's sick, Let them call the elders of the church and and be prayed for and anoint with oil 
Okay, the elders are just spiritual leaders in the church. You don't have to be uh, an official elder to come and pray for someone here this morning. But, but we believe that there is something powerful and real when we come together as a body praying for one another and, and believing for healing. There's nothing scary about the altar. This is not a place of fear, as Pastor Luke said, but it's a place of freedom. And I believe that God is going to do some amazing things. And if you're feeling empty, God is going to fill you up. And if you're scared uh, just for your life and just just afraid this morning, God's going to fill you with peace. And if you're just feeling so down and depressed, God is going to give you joy and bring color into your life. And so be ready to respond and come forward at the end. This morning, we're going to be watching a video of Alice Wetzel. Now, Alice just got here. I see her. Would you stand up, Alice, if you can, and Butch? Um, so Alice uh, is, is our testimony this morning, and this week, she had an allergic reaction to some medicine, and uh, she went into the hospital. Her temperature was 103, and her blood pressure was uh, 63 over 39, when, yeah, that's, I, I didn't know anything about blood pressure, so I looked it up afterwards. I mean, I, I knew that maybe it was like 120 over 70 is kind of normal, or maybe that's normal for me. I don't know. Um, and so it really is a miracle that you're here with us. And she was literally discharged from the hospital 45 minutes ago. What's that? 1025. So she literally just came, uh, and, and uh, she, is, she, she had that allergic reaction, and um, I, I thank God that, that Butch brought her in, and that, uh, that's just another testimony of God's um, faithfulness. And we were talking on the phone last night. She didn't know if she was going to be able to, to make it here this morning or not. Um, but I was just so encouraged because she, she told me, um, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but she goes, you know, Pastor Austin, uh, sometimes it's just kind of puzzling of the timing of all this. Of all the weeks, why would I have a freak thing like this happen when—, when I've got this testimony on, on Sunday. And, and she said, but you know what? I, I didn't let that discourage me because I've had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to share my faith with people in this hospital. There are so many nurses and doctors and patients and as dark of a place, and I've spent plenty of time, Pastor Austin, in this, in this hospital. I, I don't want to spend any more time in the hospital that I have to, but I'm glad that I can be a light in that place. And, and what a perspective to have. And I believe that you guys are going to have miracles start to have happen in your life, and we're going to hear all sorts of testimonies after today. I truly believe that. And here's the most important thing, is that they bring glory to God, our Father. Because God doesn't heal us just so that we can live a life pain-free. God heals us so that he can be glorified and that people can be spiritually healed. The, the physical healing is a testimony of, of God's ability to spiritually heal. Amen? So, um, Alice, uh, through doctor's medicine and, and God's mighty hand uh, of power, she was healed of a rare form of cancer. And it's sometimes puzzling to me um, what people uh, will give God credit for and what they won't give God a credit for. And I've heard people say, God sent you into my life for a reason. Or when someone blesses another individual financially, you say, oh, God used you in this moment to bless me. I'm so thankful for you. God, God totally used you. But when it comes to medicine and doctors and science, we often forget the one who's giving breath to those doctor's lungs. We forget the one who is the creator of everything and, 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 and the restorer of everything. And we begin to marvel and praise doctors and modern medicine. And we forget to marvel and praise the one who created it all. Alice's miracle might look different than yours. And, and just because God, hear me, just because God doesn't remove you from your trial, just because God doesn't remove you from your storm doesn't mean that he's going to abandon you and not walk you through it. He's with you, and he wants to move this morning. Some people receive healings instantly, and some people receive healings through multiple surgeries. But the bottom line is this, is that God gets the credit, God gets the glory, God gets the fame. Would you turn your attentions to the screen as we watch this powerful testimony? I have a husband. His name is Butch. I have two daughters. Uh, and um, the fall of 2004, I was diagnosed with a sinus cancer. It was a very rare one. There were only seven cases prior in the United States. 
My daughters at the time were 14 and 17. It was the most horrendous ordeal our family had ever been through. Um, it was terrifying. I would say it felt like evil hammered down on our family relentlessly. The most agonizing part of it were thoughts of my daughters. The thought of leaving them was too hard to bear. It was a war, a battle in my mind. I ran down every trail of all the what ifs. <laughs> um, what if I'm blind? What if I don't make it? What if this? What if that? Why did I do this? How did I get this? What did I do to get it? The first surgeon I saw, the only words he spoke to me were, if anyone can help you, it won't be me. The second doctor was much more optimistic. He says, oh, there's definitely things we can do. We need to do them right now in the next couple of days. I have a friend who can do this. And our conversation ended with, they do great things with prosthetic eyes. We left that appointment devastated, knowing that we were on our own to find our own surgeon. And through a connection at New Hope, we were directed to Iowa City. It was our second or third choice, knowing that um, our praying people were gonna play a critical role in this whole journey that was about to begin. I would have seven surgeries in all, one to take the cancer, six from all kinds of compounding complications. My first surgery was a 16-hour surgery. In the wee hours of the following morning, my doctor came to speak to my family, my husband, my daughters, and he said that it had gone much farther than he thought. Uh, they did remove the wisdom teeth, reconstructed my eye area with titanium, went through the top of the head, and an incision down the front of the face. And he said, she's in a coma. She may not come out of it for two weeks. We may have some brain damage because we had to do much more extensive work than we counted on. My chances of beating this cancer were reduced from 50% down to 15 to 25%. A week later, they discovered a staph infection, which caused another surgery. And that eventually would cause me to lose my forehead, being removed, replaced with a muscle from my side. I felt like we would come to a point where we'd conquer something and I'd come up for air and we'd get clobbered right back down over and over. My doctor said that you can go see her now. And my husband was devastated. He left the room to go find our daughters. And one was pulling him to go see me. The other one was pulling the other direction, terrified to come see me. I remember waking up and knowing I still have my eyesight. I couldn't focus. My eyes were swelled. My face was swollen but I had goop all over my eyes, but I could sense light, and I knew I still had my vision. And shortly I hear voices, hi mom, hi mom. And I can hear the daughter, my, my daughter's voice. I can hear my daughter's voice. I can hear my husband's voice. And I remember thinking, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And I hear Emma say, she wants to write something. And I hear my resident doctor say, she can't write anything. I hear Annie say, get a pad, get a paper. And then I hear my resident say, as I'm writing again, I picture this, but I'm doing this. My eyes are closed, I'm laying flat. My elbows are strapped to the bed. And I'm writing and the resident says, see, she can't write. And then I hear, Somebody say, she's writing one letter on top of another. Move the pad, move the pad. And then I hear, G-A-G-O-N. They're reading my words, gag on tube. And I could have leaped out of that bed because I thought I'm communicating. And I knew exactly who was in the room. Several weeks into my stay at the hospital in Iowa City, 
It was in the middle of the night. It was quiet. It was silent. Butch was sleeping on the cot beside me, as someone did every single night. It was snowing heavy. I got up out of my bed and I looked outside. And the street was deep. Everything was covered with a white blanket. And I could see a wing of the hospital across the street with just a few lights in the rooms peppered that held patients in all those rooms. And I thought to myself, I'm just one little pebble here. But I'm a very important pebble. I'm a treasure. I am a treasure to God. He does love me. Then I allowed my mind to go to that hard place with my daughters, and I said to God, God, you can't take me. You can't take me from them. I need to be here. I need to raise my children. I need to be their mother. And I heard him say, do you trust me? Don't you trust me? And I finally had to say, yes, I trust you. I trust you. And to me, that didn't mean, you're going to fix all this, Lord. It just meant simply, I trust you, Lord, whether you choose to take me home or you choose to take care of my children. It was total surrender, 100% surrender. That quiet night was my night of be still and know that I am God. I was surrounded by so many wonderful people that brought good news. The power of the word was incredible. It had the power to remove the negative thoughts and replace them, and I, but it had to be continual. I had to either have music on constantly or I would say to my daughters, read to me, read to me. Philippians 4, 4 through 8, that was one of the first cards I received and it seemed to set the tone for the whole journey and it begins with rejoice. I say it again, rejoice in the midst of my situation, a situation I had no control over, but it gave me something to do. Rejoice. I could be obedient to that. Didn't always make sense. And then it says, with thanksgiving. In prayer, let your requests be known to God. I had an incredible praying army. This church, I had prayers continuously. I have a stack of emails, six inches high of just prayers. They didn't find me in a coma. I didn't have brain damage. I had my eyesight. God gave me a miracle. My name is Alice, and I found hope in the name of Jesus. Amen. Alice said this, I'm just one little pebble here, but I'm a very important pebble. I'm a treasure of God. What a powerful reminder. What a powerful reminder. I was talking with Butch on the phone, <clears throat> and, and Butch is her husband, and uh, after this long, 16-hour long surgery, the doctor came and, and addressed him, and, and he told Butch this. He said, the tumor was, was much bigger than we expected, and we were not able to get all of the marginal area. She is in a coma, and if she comes out of it, she possibly will have brain damage. I can't fathom having someone that I love have that news of a doctor saying she's in a coma and if she comes out of it and she would likely have brain damage. My dad was at that surgery in Iowa City and, and the doctor came and spoke with him and a few other relatives and said that I'd probably give her six months, maybe six months to live. But God, but God, can I just say this morning, no matter how big your problem is, 
no matter how big your trial is, no matter how big it may seem to you, but God. And Satan likes to remind us, oh, look how big your problem is. Your, your problem is huge. There's no way that you can overcome this. We need to remind Satan how big our God is. We need to speak to that. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. This is a story of Jesus healing a man. And in previous chapter, uh, Jesus uh, is, is doing some healings and, and he's, he's teaching in the synagogues and he comes to this town called Capernaum. Now Capernaum is an important town in the Bible. Um, it's, it's actually kind of the headquarters of, of where Jesus did a lot of his ministry. He was kind of based out of Capernaum. Uh, I've, I've been to Capernaum. If you've been to Israel with the church, you've been to Capernaum. It's a very Jewish, very religious area. There was a lot of teachings in the synagogues, a, a lot of um, Jesus' miracles and, and um, different signs and wonders happened in and around Capernaum. Let's read Luke chapter 7, verse 1. When Jesus finished saying this to all the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them and he was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to this servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. I pray that you would speak through me this morning, God, that you would let faith rise up in this place in our hearts. Let us believe in you and, and your ability and your authority and your power, Jesus. I pray that you would anoint this word, God, and, and speak through exactly what needs to be spoken, Lord, and I pray for those that just feel spiritually dead, Lord, that you just begin to massage their heart back into rhythm, massage their heart back into life this morning, Lord. We pray it and believe it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen. So this is an incredible story, and I just want to sh briefly share three perspectives from this story, and then at the end, I'm going to invite people to come forward and be prayed for, and I want you to be ready to respond. The first perspective we want to look at is the Jews' perspective. In verse 4 and 5, it says this, when the Jewish elders came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. See, the Jews were stuck in this works theology. They were stuck in this, this works mentality of this man deserves to be healed. This man deserves it because of all of these great things. And, and the Jews, while they commended this man's um, work, Jesus commended this man's faith. And maybe you find yourself like the Jews today and you feel like you're constantly trying to earn something from God. You're trying to earn salvation. You're trying to earn love. You're trying to earn healing. You're trying to, to earn his presence. Can I just remind you that none of those things can be earned? There's something that is given freely to you. We just have to accept them. E Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace through faith that a man is saved. It's not by the works. It's not by your good deeds. It's not how much money you give. It's not all the kind things you say to your neighbor. It's, it's not how good of a parent that saves you. It's by Jesus' grace. It's a gift. It's a power. And, and, and this morning, we need to remember that experiencing healing and having healing, it's something that is given to you. It's nothing that you can earn. And God's love is nothing that you can earn. It's given to you. In the same way that you're not going to dis qualify yourself from God's love, you can't earn God's love either. You know, as I was thinking of my family, I was just thinking how much I love my kids and how no matter what my kids ever do in their entire life, I will always love them. Till till til my last breath, I will always love my kids. 
Now, does that mean that everything that my kids do and everything that my kids say is going to make me proud? No. Does that, does that mean that there's going to be moments that they might cause some pain and some frustration? Absolutely. But would my love ever waver for them? Absolutely not. And God is the same way. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But he chooses to pour his love and his blessings out. And the same goes for healing. The same goes for salvation. I, th- I find it ironic that later in Scripture, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus deems the town Capernaum, this Jewish um, town, as more stubborn than Sodom. He, he says this in, in, in Matthew 11. He says, if I would have performed the signs and the wonders, and if I would have taught in the synagogues in Sodom, Sodom would still be standing today. But you, Capernaum, you are more stubborn than Sodom. It's as if the Jews were all around God's miracles and, and, and seeing the miraculous power of God, but they couldn't recognize Jesus as God. It was as if the Jews couldn't understand that all they had to do was to accept Jesus. They didn't have to earn anything. They didn't have to uh, deserve Jesus. They had to accept him. The Jews' perspective was wrong, and I pray that if you find yourself in, in, in a relating with the Jews where you feel like you're just constantly earning your love for God and you're just constantly just like, man, I need to do this, 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 I need to do this. That's exhausting. You're going to live your Christian walk completely just exhausted trying to earn something that you can't earn. It's given to you. The Jews' perspective was wrong. The second perspective we want to look at is the centurion's perspective. Now, for whatever reason, the Bible doesn't record this man's name. That bugs me a little bit, because when I get to heaven, I've got this little fear that I'm going to meet people, and I'm going to say, hey, I'm Austin. What's your name? I'm Kevin. You know me. I'm Kevin. I'm like, Kevin, I don't think I know you, man. It's like, no, no, seriously, you know me. Kevin the centurion. Luke chapter 7, you read about me. Like, like, it's Kevin. I'm like, oh, Kevin, so great to meet you, man. Okay. You know, and so just for my sake this morning, I'm naming the centurion Kevin because names are important. So Kevin is a Gentile, meaning he's not born into the Jewish faith. He's not born into that Jewish, and, and he's likely a Roman citizen. And in verses six through eight, uh, G- the scriptures say this, follow along. Jesus was not far from the house when Kevin sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to this servant, do this, and he does it. The first thing that I want you to see about Kevin is that Kevin acknowledges Jesus as Lord. He says, Lord. Lord means master. It means ruler. At some point, Kevin is living in this town, and, and he's seeing all of Jesus' teachings. He's hearing about all, all these miracles and seeing these miracles, and he recognizes that Jesus has an authority placed on him from God. And so this man of authority that oversees 80 to 100 soldiers, that that very much is a very prominent, um, important person, he submits in that moment. He says, Lord, Master, Ruler, and he submits. There's this moment of surrender. In the video, Alice uh, felt like God was asking her as she's looking out the window and it's snowing. says, do you trust me, Alice? Do you trust me? And she finally replied, yes. And then she said these powerful words. I quote, To me, that didn't mean that God would heal me. It meant, I trust you whether you choose to take me home or you choose to take care of my children. It was a moment of complete and total surrender. You see, Alice has had this moment of complete and total surrender. She has made Jesus, Lord of her life, master and ruler. She is fully submitted to God's plan, to his timing, to his will. And at this, some point in Kevin the centurion's journey, he realized that Jesus was Lord. He, he himself was a man of authority. There was someone higher than him in the Roman army that, that placed authority on this 
this man's life. And, and someone even uh, higher than, than the person who placed authority on Kevin, there's a, uh, this chain of authority that's been placed down, and he understood how authority worked. And, and I think sometimes we as Christians, we forget that we have been given authority by the author of authority. Jesus Christ has given us authority. And, and we walk around just full of fear and just kind of like wussy Christians. And, and we're just kind of like, oh, we can't do anything about that. Oh, I'm so defeated. No, you've been given authority by Jesus Christ. The Bible says that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is Jesus who lives inside of you, who lives inside of me. Greater is he than Satan that's in this world. We can be conquerors. We can be overcomers. Nothing can stand in Jesus' name. Why? It's not because of our good works. It's not because of our eloquent speaking. It's not because of our money, our status. It's nothing of that. It's because God has given authority to us. When I speak, I don't speak on behalf of Austin Weaver and all of my wonderful wisdom. I speak on behalf of Jesus Christ. It's his message. It's his authority placed in, in, in my life. Maybe you find yourself here and, and, and you've forgotten that you can have power over the sickness. You can have power over the strongholds in your life, not through your own strength, not through your own power, but through Jesus' name. You see, Kevin's faith wasn't in his good works, wasn't in anything other. His, his faith was in Jesus Christ. And you can have all the faith in the world you could have all the faith in the world to win the, 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 the lottery, right? But if your faith isn't in Jesus Christ, it's, 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 it's dead end. As soon as you place your faith, which faith means this, the Greek word for, for faith is pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, okay? It, it simply means, if you were to dissect it, it means trusting obedience. It says, God, I faith in you, meaning I trust you so much that I'm going to obey you. It's, there's a difference between believing that a, a bulletproof vest will stop a bullet, you know, as officers wear those. It's, there's a difference from just believing that a bullet will be stopped versus saying, I've got faith, and I'm going to trust this, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting this on, and I'm, I'm going to allow a, a bullet to, you know, I'm, I, I trust it. There's a difference. I encourage you this morning, put your faith, put your trust completely in Jesus. And maybe there's someone here that needs spiritual healing. It starts with declaring as Jesus is Lord. It starts with humbling yourself. It starts with surrender. And, and, and at the end, you'll be invited to come forward and someone will pray with you. And maybe you um, have a need in your life that feels all-consuming. This place is, in this altar is a place of surrender. It's a place where you can say, Jesus, I trust you so much. Come what may, my faith will stand. It's a place where you can say, God, I trust you. It is well with my soul. God, I, I, I trust you in everything. Ask yourself, do you really trust God with your problem, how, no matter how big or how small it is? It could be an ingrown toenail that just is just giving you fits. Do you trust God with it? So we see the Jews' perspective. We see the centurion's perspective. Musicians, would you come? The last perspective we see is Jesus' perspective. Jesus first sees the centurion's humility. You see, the centurion didn't want to make Jesus ritually unclean by having him set foot in his unkosher home. He knew that it was going to be a major inconvenience if Jesus set foot into his home because there's all sorts of, of these ritual laws and stuff, and there's this, there's this element of humility and, and the centurion even says, I don't, I don't even see myself as worthy to approach you, God. And you see this man that could be so easily just kind of puffed up and just in pride and just kind of, you know, playing the part of the Roman soldier, yet you see this element of humility. And Jesus saw that. And then Jesus saw and, and comments on the centurion's faith. In verse 9, Jesus says this, I tell you, I have not found such great faith in even Israel. This is a Gentile who shows more belief in Jesus' reality and authority than Jesus' own people do. So Jesus sees this man's 
humility. He sees this man's faith. And the last thing that Jesus sees is this man's need. And he acts accordingly. Can I just tell you this morning that God sees every need that is represented here? Would you just, uh, if, if you have a need in your life, or, or there's uh, a need in someone else's life. Like, I've, I've got both my in-laws, they're struggling physically, and they've just been going through some stuff. I've, I've got, I've, I've got my, um, my wife's aunt, Sheila. She's, she's got stage four cancer, and they're not doing any treatment. They're just doing pain management at this point. Just saw her on Friday, Thursday, in Iowa City. Saul Madsen just had a, a major... Uh, back surgery and he's, he's got to stay flat on his back or at 60 degrees for six months. Five year old little boy. They, man, there's so many needs. If you have a, a need or know of a need, would you just raise your hand? Just, just all across this place. See, God sees your hand. He sees your need. He knows exactly what need you have in your life and I believe that healing is going to flow. I believe that God is starting to move. Can you sense his presence this morning? Can you feel him? I believe that God wants to do a miracle. If Jesus were here this morning in flesh, if he incarnated himself and he came to earth and he were in flesh and he were up here in this altar area and he were ministering and he were praying for people and he was listening to needs, there's no doubt in my mind that that many of you believe in the power of Jesus. And there's no doubt in my mind that, that some of you would, would spend all afternoon if, if just to get one minute with Jesus. There'd be a line out the door. There'd be a line outside. Word would get around, and you'd skip lunch. You'd do everything just to have Jesus minister to you. But Jesus isn't here physically. Does that change the way that we respond? No. Why? Because he said, it's good that I go away. When Jesus was taken up to heaven fully alive, we don't serve a dead God. When Jesus ascended to heaven fully alive, he said, it's good that I go because I'm sending you a helper. I'm sending you an advocate. I am sending you someone greater than me. Because if Jesus were still here physically on earth, he's in Johnson right now. Uh Uh-oh, what are we going to do? We don't have him. So we're just not, you know, we better not have church because Jesus isn't here. But now we have God's spirit that is everywhere, that lives inside us, that is in this place, that is falling over you and me in this moment. In just a moment, I'm going to open up the altars, and and, and we're going to all take a step towards God. We're going to say, God, we invite your presence. We invite your kingdom. We invite heaven to fall on this place. We invite your healing reign. We need your touch. We need your power. The same spirit that walked Jesus through his trials, through his temptations, that, that performed many miracles, is here in this place. He lives inside of you, and I believe it. I believe it. In Jesus' name, I believe it. What God uh, uh, is, is, is um, going to, to move and what Satan is, is wanting to use for grief, God is going to use for glory. What, what Satan is, is trying to use for torment, God is going to use to bring transformation. What God, uh, or what, what Satan brings for pain and trying to use for pain, God is going to use to bring purpose. What, what Satan is using to cripple your faith, God is going to use to catapult your faith. And your biggest trial right now is God's biggest testimony. And it's just starting to move. It's just starting to move. Would you stand to your feet? Oh, Jesus, move in this place, God. God, I pray against all distractions. I pray against phone notifications. I pray against people that that are, are just trying to be disruptive right now. God, I just pray that we would begin to sense your presence, that we would become aware of your presence, God. Those that have just like disconnected wires in their, their, their spirit, that, that their, their heart has just been hard and they've just been walking through life just like a robot, not feeling anything. I just pray that you would just begin to shock them to life, God. Begin to connect connectors where they can feel you, that they can sense you, that they can register. We are weak in, in, in our mind, in our flesh, God, and we need your presence. God wants to heal people this morning. I'm going to open up the altar in just a moment. In just a moment, if you need a need, I believe that God is going to meet it. But if you don't decide to come down forward and you don't have a need, you are not off the hook. Your job back in the pew is as ever as important as anybody down here ministering in the altar area. 
You need to be praying for them as if they were your mother. You need to be praying for them as if they were your brother, your sister, your kid. And we as a congregation, as a family, are going to take a step closer to God this morning. Because when one part of the body, when one part of the family hurts, the whole family, the whole body hurts. And so there are so many needs this morning and God's gonna move. Would you pray? Jesus, thank you so much for your presence and your promise, God. And I pray that faith would rise up. God, that preconceived ideas of of however this is gonna go would just go out the window, Lord, but we create room for your presence to minister, Jesus. I pray, God, that you would bring physical healing, relational healing, deep emotional wounds of healing, God. I pray that you'd bring mental healing, Jesus. And most importantly, God, we pray for spiritual healing this morning. We believe it in Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we just continue this time of worship, I don't wanna disrupt anything that's happening down in the altars, but I just feel led as I was preparing this that we as a congregation, those in the pews, um, we're just gonna pray for different needs. And so the first area um, is is that we're gonna pray uh, for those that are struggling with depression and anxiety. And, and maybe you struggle with it or someone you know, but if, if you know someone who struggles with that, would you just raise your hand and agree with me in prayer? Jesus, we pray, God, that you would bring joy and purpose and life into those struggling with depression, God. I pray that chemical imbalances would begin to become balanced, God, and that you would make all things new, God. We pray against anxiety or fear that is so crippling, but in you there is no fear. Is there anyone here that knows anybody that has cancer or or there's someone in your life that has cancer? Yes, God sees those hands. Jesus, in Jesus' name, we agree together that cancer can be quenched in the name of Jesus in a moment, God. We believe it. We're praying that tumors would shrink. We're praying that spots would disappear, that doctors would be completely astounded and that there would be a platform for testimony for headaches and migraines. If you just raise your hand, God, I pray right now for anybody that suffers from migraines and headaches, God, for, for my sister-in-law, Hannah, that's just so crippling, I pray that you would, you would just remove it in Jesus' name, that you would align things in people's spines and necks and, and heads and, and the sinuses and everything else, God. I pray that you would give them that. Lord, for, for people with the spine or back or alignment, just begin to align things in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. There's many that carry around deep hurts emotionally, maybe from childhood, maybe it's a divorce, maybe you felt betrayed, abandoned. If you know someone or or yourself, we're just gonna pray for that. And, And I just encourage you, if you're in your pews, come on, press in, press in. Jesus, we pray for those who need an emotional healing. We, we pray that, that those who just need to forgive God, that you'd give them the grace and the power to forgive, not saying that it's okay, but, but saying that I forgive you and I'm gonna choose to love you. God, I pray for those that have been uh, abused mentally, sexually, God, I pray that there'd be healing and restoration that takes place, God, that you would remove and completely remove aspects of life that needs to be removed of, of horrible things that have happened in people's childhoods, God. I pray for people that struggle with mental issues, Lord, that you'd unclog and declutter thoughts, that you'd give full reins to the individual, that that no longer they would be controlled by by, um, something or someone else, Lord. I pray relationally in marriages and friendships and child to parent, God, I pray that you'd bring healing in this moment. God, strongholds. For those who just felt like they missed the boat last week, God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, addictions would be broken. God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, chains would just fall off, just just, just begin to, to move off, God, and that there would be freedom this morning, Lord. God, I pray for those watching online, God, right now as they just lift their hand, I pray that that healing would just begin to flow, that they would feel the presence of God fill their life, God. And, and in this moment, we trust you. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for the healing that is beginning to take place. With every eye closed and head bowed across this place this morning, I just want to give the opportunity. Is there anyone here this morning that I've just been hitting the nail on the head, that you just feel empty, that you just know that you need a spiritual healing. You, you know that you're here, not by accident. You are here on purpose, and you know that you need to turn from your sin. You need to, to bow the knee, to have a, a moment of submission and, and surrender, where you say, Jesus, you are king, you are Lord, you are master of my life. Forgive me of my sins. I turn from them, and I turn to you. I run to you, Jesus. Is there anyone here with every eye 
closed, head bowed, that just simply slip up your hand and, and just say, Pastor Austin, I want to ask Jesus into my heart for the first time. Is there anyone here? I'm looking around. Is there anyone here? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, I pray a blessing over everyone here this morning. I pray for those that are just struggling with doubt. Maybe they're bitter because things haven't turned out the way that they wanted to in, in a certain situation. I just, I'm sensing that. I'm sensing that there's someone here that is just so angry with God. I pray that your love would just pour out over them in this moment. It, it would hit them unexpectedly that they would know that you never forsake them. You, you never left them, not once. They're a child of God, and you are with them the entire way. And so right now, I just pray that you would wrap your loving arms around that individual. God, that they would feel your presence. We love you, and we respond to your love. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. So often we, we come to the altars for one thing, and we leave with another. Now, I think of Naaman being dipped in the river. You know, he, he went to the river to be healed, but he left clean. Sometimes we, we come uh, for healing and we leave with peace. We, we, we come with, with a, a need and we, we leave with strength and joy and perseverance. God is in this place. He's with you.